Today I'm going to be talking about the KEF LSX2 LT. I requested to review these. I thought they were kind of interesting. They look kind of small in the photos. By the specs, it looked like they would be good alternatives to a soundbar or a desktop speaker or just general two channel use. I got them in and in this green color, and I love this freaking thing, man. Like, I, I, this is probably one of the best looking speakers I've ever seen. Even my 13 year old and a half daughter was like, oh, those look cool. Which to get something like that from a teenager, yeah, I mean, that's that's a good thumbs up, right? Right? What did I think about these speakers? Okay, well, they've got a lot of input options. The only thing they don't have is analog input. So you can't feed a turntable with these. But the other version, not the LT, that runs like $1,500 or $1,400, those do have an analog input. These don't. They retail for about $999, currently on sale for $899. Okay, so aside from that, they've got HDMI input, USB input. They've got an optical input. They've got a subwoofer output. They've got other things. And then the cool thing they have that I really like is their app. So it's called Kef Connect, and you can pull up the app, and you can make changes to this thing on the fly. You can connect Wi-Fi and Bluetooth as well. So let's say you set them up in your living room, and maybe the treble just isn't quite right, like in my case. I put them on the console. The speaker was a little bit lower than my ear by about a foot, and the treble was just a little bit. I needed more detail, right, because the, the speaker is kind of pointed at my stomach. So I pulled up the app, and I just hit the slider, and I slid over to treble, and I think I did like plus one and a half or something. I'll show you a screenshot real fast. And then I also set it into desk mode because I was curious what that would do. There's wall mode, which will basically reduce the boundary interference. What's the word I'm looking for here? Boundary starts with an R. Reinforcement. There we go. It's the boundary reinforcement. So when you put a speaker closer to a wall, the bass is going to start boosting up because you're putting the physical sound closer to another wall. And that wall is going to boost. It's going to load that sound. It's going to gain it. Same thing is... If I'm talking right now and I go like this and now I'm talking like this, my lower voice is going to get louder because there's more reinforcement there. I'm, I was covering up the highs, but the lower voice portion. Or if I go like this, it's a natural horn. You can kind of think of it the same way. Corner loading, boundary reinforcement, horn loading, those are kind of all the same principle. They work in different ways, but it's basically all boiled down to the same thing. So when you put a speaker close to the wall, it may sound a little bit too boomy. And with these speakers, what you can do is you can pull up the app and you can set the wall boundary thing, you can slide it down and you can bring down some of that excess bass. Or maybe you want more bass. You can go from standard to less to extra mode and bring in a little bit more bass or a little bit less bass if you like to. Maybe the treble's a little bit too high, you bring that down. You can also set up a subwoofer for these on the app. Just push a little button. Hey, I'm using a subwoofer. So all in all, it's a really cool product, really slick, looks really awesome. How does it sound? It sounds really good. It's for the most part a neutral sounding speaker, except there are some diffraction elements and diffraction just means the sound hits something and it comes back at you and it's out of phase with the direct sound. So maybe it's the tweeter housing or maybe it's the surround. And it's hard to tell, you can do the math, you can usually figure it out or you can do some testing and figure it out. I didn't spend the extra time to do that here. My guess is it might be surround diffraction just based on the frequency around four to 5K and the distance, it's about a four inch driver or so. So it's probably somewhere along that. But if you guys really want to, you can double check me or maybe Kef will just tell me, hey, we know what this is. Suffice it to say, that sound being a dip is much more tolerable than if that sound were a peak. If there were a sharp peak at 4K, that's going to be a lot of extra sibilance, sibilance, sibilance. But since there's a dip there, it's less sibilance and it's like... How do I dull my sibilance? Anyway. There's less of that harsh S sound. So I would much rather have the dip than a peak. Alternatively, though, people would say, well, I would much rather it be more completely neutral. But that's okay. That's one of the drawbacks of certain designs. And when you're getting a little bit of a cheaper coaxial design, like what's in this Kef speaker, it's not the reference one meta where it's $10,000 a pair, then there are going to be some, some cost-saving elements to it. Plus, you got to imagine all the other stuff you're getting packed into this thing in a relatively small size. Check this out. I'm holding these speakers. It's a small speaker. Yeah, overall, I like the sound. It does have that diffraction dip around 4 to 5K. Aside from the diffraction, it's a pretty dang good linear speaker. And the other thing that really matters is in a room. So if you're sitting close to a speaker, you want the on-axis sound, the sound that's firing directly at you, to sound good. But if you're sitting far away from a speaker, then there's room involvement. So you want the off-axis sound, the reflections, 
to be similar in tone to the direct sound. So they don't confuse your brain and make you think, oh, this doesn't sound quite right. And sometimes that can blur imaging and other things as well and mess up the tonality. And for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, here's a quick example of what I mean. In black is the direct sound when the speaker is pointed directly at your ear. And in red would be the speaker towed out by 30 degrees. That's my definition. So now you know what I'm talking about. If I say pointed directly at you on axis, black. If I say towed out, 30 degrees, 10 degrees, whatever, that's closer to the red. When all of those reflected sounds come back at you for this speaker, because it has such good dispersion characteristics, it has an overall similar tonality no matter what seat you're sitting in. Same thing for vertically. Now, most speakers, when they have a tweeter above the mid-range and the mid-range down here, if it's a two-way or if it's a three-way and it has a mid-bass, what's going to happen is you're going to run into lobing effects from the vertical displacement of those drivers. Whereas with Kef using a coaxial driver, the tweeter is right in between that mid-range. So what that does is that opens up that sound stage vertically and allows you to have a little bit more leeway as to where you sit. So you don't have to sit with your ear pointed directly at the speaker. Now, remember I said a minute ago, the speaker is about a foot below my ear level. Even with that in mind, it still sounded pretty balanced, but I wanted a little bit more top end sparkle. I used the app, boosted that treble about a decibel and a half or so. Same thing for setting this up in my computer room. I put these in the near field of my computer room about arm's length away, and they sounded really good there. That was connected via USB-C. So now let's talk about the inevitable, the cons, because every speaker is a trade-off. This speaker is small in size. Therefore, you can imagine that it is gonna be SPL limited. And as you go higher in output, not only does it increase in distortion, but it also limits the bass output via the limiter. I'll show you some data for what that is shortly and explain that to you. They're just not gonna be SPL monsters. These aren't gonna be home theater replacements. These are closer to what I would consider small to medium sized room type speakers, where if you want something that's better than a sound bar or better than most of the sound bars that I've heard, then these are a good option. If you want some nice looking speakers for your desktop setup, these are a good option. They have a lot of different placement abilities, but they're also not gonna just well out the base, even though they do extend down to about 50 Hertz. Normally I talk about recommended use and I do that because a passive speaker is only gonna behave a certain way. If you put it up next to a wall, it's gonna sound this way. If you bring it out from the wall, it's gonna sound this way, but you can't change the characteristics of the speaker itself like you can with this one. And what I mean is, this has DSP, this has an app built into it where you can control the things like near the wall placement, desk placement, base extension, face coherency even if you wanna make sure that the tweeter is perfectly time aligned to the mid range. You can play around with that. Let me know what you find out if you do. And then you also have the treble where you can just boost or bring that down and the same thing for the base, you can contour that out. So you have a lot of different options for where you set these up at. So I don't really have a recommended use per se. I would say, Set them up wherever you wanna set them up and then play around with the app to see what sounds best to you. Now let's talk about the data. All the data that you're about to see is captured using my Clipple Near Field Scanner. It is a state-of-the-art device that allows me to get anechoic data in a non-anechoic environment, such as my old garage, which you see here. And here are the speakers set up. The reason this stuff is important is because we wanna know what's the speaker doing before I put it in the room. That allows me to evaluate it on its design solely, not on its design plus my room, because that doesn't help you at all. You care what it's gonna sound like in your room. That's why we use the data as a very good predictor for understanding the performance of the speaker before it goes in anybody's room. Then we can talk about how best to set it up. Do you need this desk boundary reinforcement taken out? Do you need the wall boundary reinforcement taken out? Do you need to boost the treble? Do you need to drop the treble down? You can do all those things via the app, but understanding the best way to use it and better instances for how to use some of these certain things definitely comes into play by using the data. First up is the frequency response linearity. And this looks good, mid-range, mid-bass, all that stuff looks good, but then you get into the high frequency. We've got a diffraction dip around five kilohertz or so, and then another one around eight kilohertz. Now, I'm calling this a diffraction dip. It may not be 100% true diffraction, but I think that it might be. I don't really have anything else to go on at this point. There's also this resonance right here. You can see it's a dip in response. I believe there is some maybe enclosure resonance that's coming out of the back of the speaker. And I'll show you why I think that's the case shortly. But overall, this doesn't look great on the high end, but it smooths out in the estimated interim response, which we're gonna talk about in a second. But first, F3 at 55, F10 at 46 Hertz. So by the time these speakers get down to about 50 Hertz in the room, you've lost a lot of the bass. Again, 
small speaker. They do come with the ability to plug up a subwoofer output to it, and then you can control that subwoofer via the DSP app. CEA 2034 data set, same thing you basically saw a second ago, except for early reflections directivity and the sound power directivity. Overall, good EQ ability out of this speaker. I'm not surprised because it's a coaxial design. That's not to say that all coaxials have good directivity, but one's from Kef, one from Genelec, Mofi, those generally have. Now, people are going to say, what about Tenoy? I had no idea. I've emailed them like four times asking if I can get some stuff in from them to review. And so far, I haven't gotten anything back. So if you're interested, you guys bother them. Quit bothering me to ask about it because I've tried. Estimated interim response at 0, 10, and 30 degrees off axis horizontally. And this is pretty much how I heard the speaker. Starting with the low end extension, they get down to about 50 hertz in the room. And look, that's probably enough for most people to get some nice thump bass out of these, especially if you're listening, I'd say below about 85 decibels at about 10 feet away, which is what I was doing. When I started getting on these speakers more, I started hitting that compression and that limiter, and I started losing the ability to hear that really solid bass drum that kick drum that I like to hear at higher volumes. That's not really a surprise. Again, really small speaker. Going up in the higher frequency, the fraction elements start to peak in again. Uh, what I noted was, because this can be a con for sure, it lacks the attack of drums, but it also lowers sibilance. So I'm okay with this. In a perfect world, this is filled in, but nothing's perfect, everything's a compromise, so I'm okay with this. The other thing I wanted to note was a similar treble profile means good in-room dispersion for multiple seats and listening positions. You have the same profile at 30 degrees as you do zero degrees. I'm not saying it's the exact same, but at the profile, look how it follows. The red follows this black. The trends are the same. What this ultimately means is if you're sitting right in front of the speaker and then you move six feet off to the side and you're 30 degrees out, you're just gonna notice the difference in the higher frequency treble. In the lower treble, the upper mid-range area, that handoff is still good. And below that, it's still fine as you would expect it to be. Whereas most speakers might falter here. You sit off 30 degrees to the side, it's gonna sound like a totally different speaker. You don't have that issue with this particular speaker. Horizontal dispersion, I've got it about plus or minus 60. It kind of just depends on where you draw the line at. But for the most part, this lighter shade of red at the negative six decibel point, kind of flows through here. So I'd say on average, you're at about plus or minus 60 degrees, which to me is pretty wide. And that's right in that sweet spot for me personally. What about vertical? Also about plus or minus 60 degrees. Earlier I said there's maybe a hint of a resonance leaking out of the back of the speaker, either from the enclosure or maybe the port itself. I'm not 100% sure. And I wanna preface this by saying that I don't know that this is the problem. But one of the things that I'm seeing in the data that kind of hints at that is if we look at the edges, so this is 180 degrees behind the speaker. Same thing down here. You're starting off at zero degrees, and as you trend further away from zero degrees up or down, you're going behind the speaker. You can see that there's a strong red coming back in here. There's more energy at the back of the speaker at about 800 hertz than there is at any other frequency. So that makes me think that there's something with higher SPL being exerted out the back of the speaker. And generally what I find is that it's either a port resonance itself or it's a resonance in the enclosure and it's just escaping through that port. I don't know which one it is. Not sure that it really matters. Did I hear this issue? I, I don't have any idea. Is it a real issue? Not to me, but maybe to you. Distortion at 86 decibels at one meter. This actually looks pretty good for the size of the speaker. 96 decibels. Okay, now I'm seeing what I expect to see. It's gotten a little bit higher. It's hit that 3% distortion threshold that I personally use to say, all right, this is probably the area you're gonna start running into some issues. 96 decibels at one meter. If you add another speaker to this, you're at 102 decibels at one meter and you're still within a reasonable amount of distortion. So I'd say that for most people, if you're listening to maybe 70 to 85 decibels at maybe three meters away, then you're probably okay in terms of distortion. Now let's talk about multi-tone distortion. This is where things start to show up and get pretty high. This value right here in green, 0.316 volts, that's the input to the speaker. And that equates to about 96 decibels at one meter. Same value that we just talked about for the harmonic distortion. And that is well above my personal 3% threshold. It looks like the better value is gonna be around 88, which is this gray, or around 78, which is this gray. And that kind of gives me an idea of, hey, that's probably the point where multi-tone distortion is going to start creeping in and you might notice it. I would say more than likely you're going to notice it this highest output. And when I was running this test, 
I did notice it. In my listening, I was closer to this gray, which is again, 88, and this gray, which is around 78 decibels at one meter equivalent, which works out to be, I don't know, probably around the same, just add about six decibels for the pair of speakers and maybe a couple more decibels for room gain. That was adequate for me in my listening, and I didn't really have any issues noticing multi-tone distortion at my listening distance, but I also wasn't wailing on these things because again, small speaker. Now my typical dynamic range compression testing, I couldn't do for this speaker because the way I was testing it was via Bluetooth. And the Bluetooth transmitter that I have, I didn't really trust it for doing this kind of output level or the kind of output level that I normally do up to 102 decibels. So instead, what I'm giving you is the compression multi-tone distortion testing. This is always on my website, so I'm not doing anything new. I'm just talking about this one rather than the other tests that I was unable to perform. And really, I get the same kind of information from it. It's just a different way of looking at it. So what I'm seeing here is this 0.316 volt input, 96 decibels or so output. In green, there's about four decibels of compression. This four line right here, this four decibels of compression below about 60 hertz. So I'm saying bass is limited to about 92 decibels at one meter for one speaker. But the mid range, we hit about two decibels of distortion. So it's about 94 decibels at one meter in the mid range. Ultimately, what I'm saying is if we look at this gray line, which is closer to this value, which is closer to 88 decibels, there's less compression there. So I'm gonna say between about 88 to about 92 decibels is kind of that compression mark and probably 92 decibels at one meter for the one speaker is probably gonna be your maximum output before compression starts to take over and really limit that base output. I listen around usually 85 decibels at about 10 feet away. So if you do some math, you can take some of that out. But these speakers did a good enough job for me. Again, they're not gonna hit ear splitting levels. And you're gonna to wanna to subwoofer if you want that low bass below 50 Hertz. But just being honest here, they look fantastic. The app has tons of features. There's a lot of inputs available for this guy. And it works with HDMI. I just plug it in my TV and it replaced the soundbar that I was using, which is an old Vizio. And then I also have a JBL soundbar. These speakers sounded miles above those soundbars, even though those soundbars came with a subwoofer. I would still take this speaker. Okay, so if you made it this far, Awesome. If you have any comments, questions, or concerns, leave them in the comments section below. If you'd like to support me financially, you can do so a couple of different ways. The cheapest way, if you have anything that you want to buy from Amazon or Crutchfield or Best Buy, like for example, these speakers, use my generic affiliate link, click that link, and then type it in whatever it is that you want to buy, buy that thing, and I'll get a small commission. It doesn't cost you anything extra, and it's a great way to help me keep doing what I'm doing. Alternatively, if you'd like to join me at patreon.com slash Aaron's Audio Corner, you can join me there to get some behind the scenes information, some polls, you can interact with me directly, and I also will release videos early. And then sometimes I'll do special little videos just talking about some stuff behind the scenes that isn't released publicly. Again, that's a great way to interact. You get some extra little perks and you can support what I'm doing if you really want to do that. I would certainly appreciate it. With all that said, I'm out. We'll talk to y'all later. Take care.